Hello everybody and welcome back to Wild Card Workshop. Today we're going to be continuing on with our Dino Shrine mod and finally getting that UI put in that we talked about in the last video. Now this UI is just going to be a simple one. We're only going to be changing a single setting and that is which creature is being saved as the structure's spawnable. Now to get to that point we're actually going to have to do quite a bit in this video. We have to create a communications actor so that we can communicate from the structure to the UI, and I'll explain why as we're actually building it out. And we're actually going to look at a new subject today, just ever so briefly, uh, which is blueprint interfaces. Now we will cover that more in depth in the next video. Blueprint interfaces are a pretty broad and malleable topic and there's a lot of cool stuff that I want to show you. I'm going to show you how we used it, where we put it in, but we're not going to go into a whole lot of information on blue on blueprint interfaces today. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and hop into the dev kit and I'll show you how it's done. So before we dive into the changes that we've made, we need to cover some new information regarding widgets. Now widgets are UIs, UI elements. Okay, this is using UE4's system of UMG, which stands for Unreal Motion Graphics. Now, to create a widget or a UI, we need to come over here to the content browser, right click, down here in user face, and find widget blueprint. Okay, I'm just doing that test. Now, a couple things that you need to know about working with widgets in the Arc Dev Kit is that the root widget of a UI element, the one that's going to be added to the viewport from your system, okay? We'll call this the master widget for the purposes of this tutorial. This needs to be a child of primal UI. Okay, you see up here, it says parent class user widget. We can't do this for the root one, for the master. It will cause problems. So what we do is after we've created our widget, we go to file, reparent blueprint. And then once we get this list, we want to search for primal UI. And there we go. And you see our parent class is primal UI.h. Save that. Well, actually, we didn't need to do that because we're not going to keep this particular widget file, but we're going to use it to kind of show your way around. So you'll see we've got this designer tab here instead of like our defaults tab or anything like that in regular um, class blueprints. What this is, is it's similar to if you've ever done maybe web design work or anything like that. This is a visual designer for us to work with laying out all the different elements of our UI. Now, the thing is that we can make widgets, we can place widgets within other widgets, okay? So if we have any of these sub widgets, those do not need to be children of primal UI. Those can be user widgets. It's just this parent one, the one that is being added to the viewport to the, the player's screen at runtime, that needs to be a child of Primal UI. So don't forget that. So to work with this, you'll notice we've got this empty tab here. If you go over down to the hierarchy, this is a system of placing things within other things and anchoring them. So we've got our canvas panel. This is the main section. This is sort of what fills our viewport. So if we wanted to add something to it, we can say add another canvas panel here. And with this one, we can go, let's say the anchor is in the center of the screen. We'll say the size of it, the total width of it will be 500. And the Y will be 300. And you'll notice it's the widget itself, even though we've anchored it in the center, it's placing that up at the top left corner. If we want to change that, you can come down here to alignment 
and change these to 0.5 and 0.5. And that'll move the anchor point to the center of the widget that you're adding. So now we've got sort of this little sectioned off end area. And we can do things like add a button to it or let's say we add an image, okay? And then we set its anchor to the full thing. We will undo all of these sizes. So depending on the way the method of anchor that you use determines whether or not these are offsets or size declarations. So because we are anchoring it to the full thing, all of these values become offsets. So you'll notice here, offset right and offset bottom, 100 and 120. This is now a hundred units away from the right side of the parent element and 120 units away from the bottom side of the parent element. So we can just set that to zero and zero and it fills the whole thing. Now down here in the, the appearance, we could for instance set an image to fill this section or you can set a color. Let me put up there and oh look, now we've got sort of a little widget in there with a color. Now, some of these widgets can only have a certain, like a single child or a certain number of children. The canvas panel is your primary one for laying out multiple widgets in an area. So for instance, we can have this image and then we can drop a button and a combo box. And these can all just kind of fit in here. But if say we look at this button, we can take and put a text block in it, but only one. It'll only accept one sub widget, which is in this case, a text block. So now we've kind of set up our very ugly little widget here. There's other settings depending on the type of widget, whether it's horizontal, vertical alignments, uh, default text in the case of these text elements, uh, shadow color font, you know, sort of what you would expect if you were editing something in a web UI. However, we also have the option of these elements themselves being variables. So you'll see this is variable. If there's something that you want to change the properties of at runtime, make sure that in the element you have is variable checked. So in the case of our button, if we go over to the graph, we'll notice we have a variable there, a reference to our button or to our combo box or to the image. So now in graph, we can change the properties of this in code. And there's functions to help with that too. It's, uh, let's see here. Sometimes they take a little bit of searching. Yeah, maybe not use the image. If we come down to combo box, for instance, we get that one. We do turn that off. Go combo box. And you can see that there's a bunch of options here for getting the selected index or option as a string or setting the values or changing the number of options available in the dropdown list. So that'll give you some of the ability to make maybe some more dynamic UIs as well, which is actually something that we're going to do in the case of our Dino Shrine. So this was just sort of a brief overview of how to navigate widgets. And there's also things like animations too. You can animate sections of the widget. If you're familiar with animation and keyframes, this is a place that you can do that and change properties of like images or colors or in animations. But now that we've kind of seen how to work with this and you've seen a couple of elements you can find more here. You can actually also make your own and that's by making sub widgets. So if you make your own custom button widget that has its own functions and callbacks, you can add them in here as well. Or you can programmatically add them using the graph 
if you want like a list of buttons that procedurally generate based on available data or something like that. So now that we've kind of taken a look at that, let's go ahead and delete this. We don't need this one. Yep, goodbye. Don't need you. And where we start is in our Dino Shrine BP. Actually, before that, I created a Dino Shrine widget. It's a very simple one, nothing complicated, but I also created this blueprint actor called Shrine Com Actor. And now this is just the parent is actor. And in the defaults, all I did was tell it that it replicates and it's hidden in game. Okay. Now what the purpose of this Shrine Com Actor is, is if you remember from our replication videos, in order to communicate between a singular client and us and the server, we need to have an actor under our control that is owned by the client. And that's what this is. We are going to attach this shrine com actor to the player at runtime and use it as a network medium to communicate with our UI. Because here's the thing about UIs, they only exist on the client. They, in a dedicated server environment, the server knows nothing about the, the UI. Now, in a player server or a listening server environment, the server does have UIs, but that UI is for that player that is the server. So we still need to use a com actor for that scenario. So we have this, we have our UI, and in our Dino Shrine BP, we have added one function actually. So what we did is here, if you remember from our BP try multi use, we'd set up that option for opening the settings. Now, all I did was for the index, I added a new function that gets called called start UI. In this function, we get the pawn we're going to need this reference for a few points in, during this function. We make sure it's valid just to make sure that there isn't any strangeness or unexpected scenarios that this is being used on. We spawn an instance of our shrine com actor. Now, you'll see we've got a few extra pins here. I don't think I have shown you how to do this before. When you create a variable, you have the option of these here. Okay, let me maximize that. I apologize. You have editable and expose on spawn. Now, this has to be checked in order for this to work. Expose on spawn will add a pin to the spawn node. And what this is, is this acts like a constructor in uh, C++, so these are parameters for the initial construction. So these values will be set when this is created, when this reference is created. Now the catch here is that in order for these pins to show up, the class has to be set here. If you are setting it from a variable, these won't show up. So make sure that if you want to have access to these that you are using it in this format. Now, for these variables, we need a reference to this structure, which we give it here. We need a list of valid creatures for the UI. So I make an array. I just pulled off this pin and searched for make array in the list right there. And then I just filled in a few elements with specific creature classes that I want to add to the UI. And then for instigator, I just gave it the reference to the pawn of the player that pressed the option. Now, once we have the reference, we're going to set the owner of the reference right here. And we use the controlled pawn again for that. And then you'll see there's this init function. And we're calling this init function on the shrine com actor. Okay. So over here in the shrine com actor, we have this init function. And the way it works is on a dedicated server environment, 
it calls ROC start UI, which is a replicated function run on owning client. So this will get called and then it'll call the spawn UI function. If we're on a player server or a listening server, it'll just go straight to the spawn UI function. And this is actually incorrect. Delete that. Just do this. This is all we need to do. Because in a player server environment, we need it to call for the clients as well. So just do this. Okay. If it is the local player server that's calling it, this will still get called there as the owning client and it'll reach it. So I apologize. That was unnecessary and it would have actually led to some problems, but good to know. So we've got that. Now our spawn UI function, we've gotten our this list of valid creatures from this from the uh, sh shrine structure. And what we're doing here is we're getting the class default option object. Now what this is, is it is an instance, uh, the, the first instance of the class that's created. This instance is not actually used in game directly, but rather it's an instance from which further instances are copied. So it's like a template version. So if we get this class default object, we can access all of the values, the default values of that class in order to get things like a descriptive name in this case. So we can get the name of the creature itself or any values because you can't access them from the class directly. So after we have gone through that loop and gotten all the names of our creatures, which is which is strings, in this L out strings, which is a local variable. So once we're done with getting that list and the loop completes, we come down here, we get the owner controller, check to see if we have a valid reference to shrine UI. Now, normally we shouldn't, this should be invalid because we should not have created a shrine UI somehow yet, but this is more of a safety precaution. Maybe somebody's spamming the button and it's doing some oddities that are unexpected, but in the event that it's doing what we expect and that is not having a UI here yet, it will come up here and it will create the widget. Now this node is just the create widget node and then we set a class, which is our Dino Shrine UI class. And again, you can do the same thing with this, where if you have a variable in here that you want to expose on the spawning, do the same thing, set it as editable and expose on spawn. And when you set this value, the class value to that class, it'll add the new pins. So we set the owning player as the controller. We set the dino string variable that is in our UI to the list that we've made here in this function. And we set a reference to com actor. Now, something to keep in mind is both in the case of this com actor, the variable type here is just actor. Okay. And for the structure ref, it's just primal structure. Okay. So these are not specific to our, these reference types are not specific to our classes. And there's a very specific reason for us doing that. We need to be able to communicate between all of these classes. And what is happening here is we need to have a reference for us to communicate information back to it but we need to make sure that we're not creating a hard reference back to a class that already has a hard reference to the class we're in. Otherwise we're creating a, a loop of circular references and this is bad. Okay. We don't want this. So imagine for a second that we've got class, class, class. Now, this class has a reference to this one. Okay. 
I cannot draw and paint, don't judge me. This class here has a reference to this one. Now when I say a reference, I mean like we are casting to it or we're spawning an instance of the class using it, something that creates a hard reference to that class that requires the editor to include the information about that class when compiling this one. So right now with this alone, the way this works is when these classes get compiled, all of this class's information is going to get included in this one. And all of this class's information is going to get included in this one. Here's the problem. If we try to create in this class a hard reference to this class, what happens? Because now we're trying to include this class's information in this one, and this class's information in this one, and this class's information in this one, and it's just looping. And you'll see this when this occurs in the editor because you'll compile a class, and then another class might suddenly need a save and uh, strict compile. So you'll compile that one. And then suddenly another class will need it and you'll strict compile that one. And then suddenly that first class needs it again. And there's no way to get them all to have that nice little green check mark there. It'll just keep looping back and forth. So the way that we prevent this is we will sort of forward declare is the term in um, C++ or in other programming languages, but we can't really do it the right way in Blueprint, so we kind of cheese it a bit. So when I created, when I spawned these, I gave a an instance, a reference to the uh, class that is spawning it, but I assigned it to a variable type that is higher up in the, the hierarchy, the class hierarchy. So now, in the way that I have this set up, the Dino Shrine BP has a reference to the Shrine Com Actor, like a direct hard reference. The Shrine Com Actor has a, a hard reference to Dino Shrine UI. But Dino Shrine UI only has a hard reference to Actor. And we have assigned a more specific reference into the variable, but the variable is only of actor. So if we say pull off of this pin or pull off of this variable and try to access its functions, we can only access the functions and variables that are inherently available in actor. So we have prevented creating a hard reference to the shrine com actor, but managed to keep a reference to it. A, a reference to that instance. And in the shrine com actor, we did the same thing with the structure reference. This is only a, uh, including the information of the primal structure parent class, but not our specific dino shrine structure class. And this is really important. And this is, we're gonna counter, we're gonna keep from creating that hard reference by using interface blueprints. So an interface blueprint you can find them under Blueprints, and you'll see Blueprint Interface. You can create a new one of those. Now, what these are, if we open the ones that I've created here, is they are just declarations of functions. That's it. Oops. If I open this function, you'll notice you can't edit it, okay? If you want to make changes to it, you do it through the inputs and outputs of the function, okay? So we are only declaring a function signature with no implementation. The implementation gets determined by the class that you add that interface blueprint to. You can add interfaces by going up here to blueprint props and then implemented interfaces. You just come down here, you go add, and then you add the interface that you want it to have. And then if we come back up here to the event graph, you'll notice there is this this event here. Okay, event set new spawnable dino. That is actually on this interface right here, set new spawnable dino. Once you've added that blueprint, it'll show up in your add event list. 
event set new spawnable dino. And you'll know it's a blueprint interface function because it'll have that little symbol there. So anytime that we call this function using the interface messages, it'll call it here. But how do we do that? So let's go ahead and go down all the way to our shrine UI again, because this is the last one in the set. So we've kind of followed the flow of information from the shrine BP oops, to the shrine, to the com actor, to the UI. Okay. Finish up our UI real quick. Actually, after we've created the widget, we set uh, our reference to it here. We add it to the viewport. This was our talking before. Okay. Shrine UI, add to viewport. And then after we've added our UI to the viewport, we need to set, and this is using the, um, the player controller. We set show mouse cursor to true, and we set input mode UI only. And this makes it so that you can actually interact with the UI. Otherwise you're still using the game controls to move your player around. So now at this point, we have added the UI to our viewport and the player can see it. Now, once the UI is created, which is this event construct, we take the dino string, which was set from right here. Oops. We loop over it and we get our drop down menu and add an option for each one. So we've dynamically populated our dropdown menu. Now on here, you see I've got this button right here. You can add like events to some of these. In this case, you'll want to come down here after you've selected your button, go to events, and there will be an add on clicked. You click that and it'll add this node right here. So from there, when it's clicked, I tell it to get the reference to the dropdown, get the selected index, so we know what option has been selected in the dropdown, and then with our com actor, okay, now we're starting to try and go back up the chain. We, we take the reference to our com actor, which is an actor reference, and we have this strange thing here. We're calling the function that we desire on the uh, shrine com actor, without actually needing to give cast to that class. So this is what an interface is. You see this little message symbol right here. This is an interface message. So if you right click and you don't pull off of a, um, a, a variable reference to do this, you just right click plane into the graph and you come down to this section that says interface messages and you'll find sections for all of your interfaces. So here under icom actor, you'll see set selected creature index and it adds it. And it has that little message symbol. So the way these work is they don't care about the type of instance that they're being called on. The way an interface works is if you call an interface message on an actor or a blueprint or something like that, or an object. If it implements that interface, the function will be called. If it doesn't implement that interface, the message is discarded. It's safely and cleanly discarded. You won't have any crashes as a result of it. So now we are, we are calling this function on the shrine com actor right here without having to create a hard reference to the shrine com actor class. So now our references are only one, our hard reference is only one way. Only the shrine com actor is including the dino shrine UI class information. The dino shrine UI class is not in including the shrine com actor information. Okay. So there's a little bit of a, a process of ownership or a chain of command, so to speak, 
The Dino Shrine BP knows everything about the Shrine Com Actor. The Shrine Com Actor knows everything about the Dino Shrine UI. But not the other way around. The Dino Shrine UI only knows what its boss is. And is just asking a question. Do you have this function? And the boss, the Shrine Com Actor, is just saying, yes, I'll take that message. Or, nope, not my problem. And the same thing is happening up here in the Shrine Com Actor. Once we get that message, we tell it, hey, we need you to communicate this information back to the server for us. Because right now, remember, we're on the client. The UI only exists on the client. So we're telling it, schedule this event to be run on the server side. And then we're getting our controller again. We are turning off the mouse cursor. We are setting input mode to game only. And then we are removing our UI from the viewport. So we have said, hey, get rid of the UI now. And then once the next replication event occurs, this function here will get called. And we get our list of valid creatures using the creature index, which we got from the dropdown. We get which creature that actually maps out to, and we call another interface function on our structure reference. So our structure reference has this iDino Shrine interface, which says set new spawnable dino right here. If it doesn't implement that interface, this just gets discarded safely. No crashes, no problems. But we have again avoided creating that hard reference to the Dino Shrine BP class we won't end up with any circular references as a result of this. So once this gets called, we get our structure ID, we create our um, Dino Shrine data, which is what we use for our persistent settings. We set the class, and then I've just filled in the default values here because we haven't created UI settings for them. But you can see how you might create other options to set these. And then we, after we've created it, we call save shrine settings, and it, which saves out these persistent settings as we have set up in previous videos. Whew, so that was a lot. That was a lot to unpack. Um, I suggest kind of watching over this a couple times. We did it very quickly. Okay, so if some of this seems confusing the first time around, watch it a few times, get the hang of it, look at the source files that I've included with the video, take it apart, break it, see what happens, okay? We covered a lot of different pieces of information in order to get the information from our Dino Shrine BP down to a UI and back. Now let me save and compile these because I dirtied all of my blueprints and I will show you it working in Pi. As you notice, like, as I was talking about before with the circular references, when you compile, if you had a circular reference, these would just keep rotating as having dirtied the file. But that doesn't occur because we have created a clean chain of references. So let's go ahead and take our primal game data BP, put it into our override for the map, and hit play. Now we will find our item right there. Give item quantity one. Spawn, create. So now I come up here and I hit change dino settings. Whoa, there's our UI. And there's our list of creatures. Now it's not very pretty, I know. Um, UIs can take quite a bit of work to make look good. That's gonna be a matter of practice and looking up tutorials on materials and UI techniques. And let's face it, I'm just not that great at making UIs, but I wanna teach you the functionality of it. So if we hit Ankylosaurus and we hit save, and oh, there it is, it's been set. And then in the live game, if you were to have set that 
and then restarted your server. Those settings will persist once it comes back online. It'll spawn another, another Anki and your settings will have survived. And there you have it. Happy day. Yay! Woo, we did it! It's not very pretty, but it's progress. So now you see how to set up a UI communicating with a structure. This can be applied to other aspects of your game as well, not necessarily just a structure, but anything that's not owned by a player client. This can be used as a means of giving you a user interface to interact with it. Now, as always, I have included the project files for this down below if you want to take a look at them. And if we only covered a single option for the structures in this video, but if you would like to experiment with adding more, by all means, go ahead and do that. In a future video, I might fill out the rest of those options and then you can compare with how I did it and how you ended up choosing to do it. See what the differences are. Because just because I do something one way doesn't mean that there aren't other viable ways of achieving an objective. So in the next video, we're going to cover more about interface blueprints. And I'm going to show you both how they're intended to be used and also how I use them in a modding situation. Because they're particularly useful when we've only got this small set of files that are trying to all talk to each other and they're all referencing each other and we can run into problems with that. Uh, circular references are not a fun thing to have to try and debug, especially in the UE4 editor. So we can actually use blueprint interfaces as a means of organizing all of that and getting rid of a lot of those referencing problems. And I'll show you how to do that in the next video. But until then, Happy modding.